<clears throat> um, Matthew and I have uh, worked on eight movies together. And, uh, you know, just on a personal note, I want to say thank you. Uh, there's no way that I would have uh, been into the Hall of Fame without, uh, you know, hooking up with you and working all of the movies. So thanks, buddy, for making it happen. You're very welcome. And um, I would like to just uh, bring up this first uh, photo, please, if we could. Off to a, a good start. That's it. So this is uh, just Matthew's last 10 years right off of his IMDb yeah. page. That's good. So you can see uh, that we're dealing with, uh, obviously, a, a heavy hitter. And, um, and uh, you know, some of those movies we've, we've worked on together and some that uh, some we haven't, but what an, what an impressive body of work. Um, so before we talk about all the corralling, um, I just want to talk about you a little bit. So uh, you were born in the UK, and you had a, an interesting uh, upbringing. So tell us a little, bit, a, a little bit about your dad and uh, your memories growing up. Yeah, uh, I was born in London. And my father was in the movie business. He was a stuntman, stunt coordinator, became a second unit director. And uh, he worked for a director uh, called Blake Edwards, directed a lot, all the Pink Panther films. My father was Peter Sellers' stunt double. So I grew up on movie sets. Some of my first memories are on movie sets. And uh, when I was about 15, my father had the opportunity to move to America and continue working for Blake Edwards and our family emigrated. Uh, and uh, shortly after that, a couple of years later, guess where I got a job? Working for Blake Edwards. So that's a good point. Um, you know, uh, there's a word nepotism, and it's not necessarily a bad word. You know, there's a, a lot of different paths to get the door open. And if you have a family member that can hook you up, I mean, that's got to be, that's one of the best ways. And uh, there's, you know, there's not, it's not a bad word if you make the best of that opportunity. Whatever way that you can open the door is, is good as long as you take advantage of uh, the opportunity. So um, did you always know that you wanted to be an AD even, uh, you know, as you were, as you were uh, hanging out with your dad on the set? I thought my career would probably be in the movie business. And I, as I say, some of my earliest memories are on movie sets. But I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I had a somewhat of an art background. And I thought at one point I might want to get into the art department. But going and talking to the art department guys, it wasn't what I thought it was. It wasn't that creative thing. It was a lot of you know, designing sets and technical stuff and all of that. I didn't really think that was the right thing for me. And then. Uh, a couple of things really happened. One thing is I saw this documentary about the making of Gandhi. And in Gandhi, they had the biggest crowd scene ever shot in a movie. They had 300,000 extras for the Gandhi burial scene. And this documentary showed the behind the scenes of how they organized all of that. And I thought, wow, that looks kind of interesting. And, and then the first job I got, um, I badgered everybody I knew until I got a job. Really the lowest rung you could possibly enter, I was looking after the cruise cars. I'd sit in my car all day and make sure nobody broke into the cruise cars. But you did the best job that you could oh, with that. And nobody's car got broken <laughs> into Harry, so I was obviously very good at it. Um, but what happened in, in you know, those days, this was just shortly after D.W. Griffith. Um, the movies wouldn't have these huge production staffs, you know. Uh, we've done stuff together. Uh, for example, we worked together in Spain, and it was me and Larry, and we had a, a Spanish crew of ADs as well, and we had 100 PAs because we were doing car chases through streets of Seville and stuff, and every doorway and everything had to be blocked up. But in those days, your production team was first AD, second AD, maybe a second, second AD. And so I was the guy by the payphone, and the second AD was on the set, and he said, look, if I give you uh, a radio, would you make some phone calls for me? And that was like, great, because you know, sitting in your car for 14 hours a day with nothing to do is not the most exciting thing to do. So it gave me something to do, and I felt part of the project, even though I didn't even see where they were shooting. They were miles away. But I got things like responsibilities of, hey, they want to put the actor in a helicopter. You've got to get, call the office and make sure it gets insured. 
So it got me more involved with it a little bit. You also, uh, like me, one of your early jobs was working in the production office as an office yes. PA. So, uh, you know, everybody in this room, even if they just started here, are somewhat close to graduating. Yes. So, um, you know, it's important for them to kind of start to plan what they're going to do once they get out of here. And, um, you know, everyone has a kind of a, a different path that they can take. Not everybody's going to have the same path. You don't, you don't have a, a dad that's a second unit director. And, you know, my, you know, my sister's cousin's brother got me my first job. Everyone's going to have a little bit of a different path. But, um, you know, uh, even Matthew Dunn, uh, you know, a prolific first AD, and myself, you know, both started in the production office. And so some of the skills that you guys need to, work e to be working on are making coffee. <laughs> and making copies because that's what both of us started out doing. So, you know, if that's, if that's where you start, then make sure that you're making the best coffee and the best, best copies. And even, you know, I see a lot of, you know, my student first ADs in here. And, you know, that might be the last time that you're a first AD for a while. But, you know, categorize those experiences and, and then refocus that on making the best coffee that you can. I think, I think something that, you know, is sort of a, a credo of mine is that, Attitude is everything, no matter what you're doing. People want to be around people they, they like, you know? If you are making coffee and making copies and you really want to direct and you don't stop telling everybody and you're driving crazy and you're complaining because you're making coffee, they're not going to want you around. No matter what position you, you do, everyone, you're there so long on movie sets or whatever you end up doing. It's, it's the entertainment business tends to be very long hours. People want to be around people with good energy and, and happy to be there. And I think attitude, uh, I tell everyone that works for me, attitude is the most important thing. Yeah, I totally agree. So, um, so you did, uh, then you transitioned into being a set PA, you know, which is uh, you know, entry level for, for many ADs. And, uh, you know, even having the connections and having the great attitude, uh, you were a set PA for about five years. And in that five, it took you five years to accumulate 722 days, you told me. So yes. here, you know, just, just to give you guys a glimpse into your futures, here's a guy, you know, that has connections and that has a great attitude and is, you know, really doing a great job. And still, it takes five years, you know, of being a PA uh, to, to get that many days. So, you know, you guys have to understand that these jobs are, are difficult to get and, you know, they're few and far between. Um, so... Um, I was going to ask you that, you know, you had a lot of jobs actually, even, even though you were doing very well, you had a lot of jobs that you applied for that you didn't get as a PA. I did. Uh, I did my first job on the set and loved it and thought, this is, this is where I want to be. I want to be on a movie set. Office for, is for the birds. Forget it. I want to be here where the camera is and everything's happening, you know? And finished the movie and, you know, on it for four or five months and feeling really great. And this is what I want to do. And then what? You know, it's like you've, you've got your connections that you've made on that film. So, you know, every movie you go on, you're going to make, there's several people that can get you in the next job, right? If you're a PA, you've got all the ADs can get you a job or maybe the production manager or something like that. But if you've only done one film, that's maybe four people. And in those days, uh, on a movie, you would have one or two PAs. Uh, so the jobs were scarcer and there was less product. It wasn't you know, everything on cable TV and the internet and, and everything like that. So there was less job. So I tried to get everything. I called everybody I know. I called everybody that, that my family had connection to. I went through all the ads in Variety. I went through all the ads in Backstage West, which is a, a newspaper and, uh, for actors. I don't know they still do that. But all these, all these options. And I went for like 22 jobs I went after, and I didn't get anything. So you have to be, you, you know, you, you just have to, you know, be persistent, guys, and you have to understand that there's going to be a lot of jobs that you don't get, you know, a lot of gigs that you don't get, and it doesn't mean that you're not good, and it doesn't mean you, you keep going for it, but um, you have to expect that that's going to happen as you guys uh, get started. But I, I think that's something that happens through your whole career, you know, it's, it's, there's jobs you're going to go after jobs, you're not going to get them no matter what you have on your resume, it's, but a lot of it, the higher up you get, but I don't even know it's the higher up you get, but a lot of it is personality and making that connection with people. What were you, how did you, I mean, survive if you, you know, at that time as a young uh, PA and you weren't working uh, as consistently as you wanted to? I uh, had a sign that said, I will work <laughs> for uh, coffee. I said, no, um, it, was, it was tough, you know. I mean, I had support from my parents, which is great, but I, I was pretty young. I mean, I started when I was 17. So um, there was that. Um, and it was, 
It was, so financially I was okay. I was, I was, they were very great. They, 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 they've always been great. But um, it wasn't so much that. It was, it was more about how to deal with this. You know, you come out of, I'd come out of high school and now you're in this adult world and you're getting rejected everywhere you go. And uh, that, I think, would deter a lot of people, but I was very determined to do what I wanted to do. And in those days also, the, 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 thing, the movie business never stops changing. But in those days, to become an assistant director, you, you uh, didn't have to do what now is called a third area. Once you were in the guild, you were in the guild. But there was a lot less people doing it, and it was very, very difficult to get in. Now there actually is a way uh, to get in, but this, I had to fight the guild. And people said, oh, you're never going to get in the guild. It's not going to happen. The way you're doing it, not going to happen. I said, yeah, it is. And it was, it was, I mean, it wasn't just based on my saying, oh, yes, I'm going to make this happen. I mean, I'd done the research. I know that it could happen. But, um, yeah, I just didn't give up. While we're, you know, talking about your experience as a PA, uh, and, you know, we do a lot of hiring of PAs, and many people in this room would like to be a PA here pretty soon. So, um, you know, when we were chatting yesterday, um, I asked you what you thought, you know, really sets PAs apart, and you said something pretty insightful, uh, consistency. So talk a little bit about, about that. I mean, about you know, setting a bar of excellence and then you have to maintain that. As a first AD, what happens, is, uh, happens to me is I'll get a bunch of people that work for me. And in the beginning, they're all great and they're happy to be there. And then on day 35, when you've worked 14 hours every day and it's not as great and you know, maybe shoot in the, the rain or the, the swamp or wherever you are, some of the attitudes go down. And then uh, you feel that if you have you know, seven or eight m people that are your full-time staff, if only two or three of you are caring, you feel pretty abandoned. You know, Everybody needs to stick with you. It's a team. And you, you have to stay consistent. It's no use coming in the first three weeks being, oh, this is great. This guy's fantastic. And then the last three weeks, you couldn't care less. You know, and that's, that's the worst thing you can do. I'd rather you be medium the whole way through <laughs> Then be great because I know you're great. You know, I know you can be great, but then if you if it gets bad, then it's like, well, you're just giving up. There, you know, and and as I tell you guys all the time, there's there's just it's very competitive. There's a, a small number of jobs and a lot of people looking for them. So if you guys are lucky enough to land one of these jobs, you have to set the bar and you have to keep it there because there's always somebody at home waiting by the phone who's ready to come in and you know give give that 100. percent But I also have to say there that you know it's it's not just the, the AD department, it's everybody, you know, and quite often you're there and it's like, you see the departments they've given up and it's like, well, I cannot tell you how many times I've finished a movie and the producers or the directors have come up to me and said, thank you for sticking with this and just being consistent and keeping with it. And that's really what people appreciate. They want to know that you're solid and you're going to be there every day and doing what you do. So I asked you also uh, yesterday, um, you know, about resumes and you know you don't look at too many resumes usually PA resumes come through the second AD but uh, obviously you know yeah. what don't you want to see on on a resume don't make any spelling mistakes I'll, I'll throw your resume in the trash yeah. and I think a lot of people are like because okay? it's an important thing you know you might be doing paperwork and all of that and if you can't get that right and you can't get the people's names that you work for right. And nowadays you can it, there's so much information available you can find out like Larry just pulled up my MDB page. You can find out everything about people, right? So it's, it's really important to get those things right. So even, even you were telling me, you know, even as a first AD and, you know, you, get, you have an agent, you get called in for meetings, when you're going to meet with a director, you research them. And oh, yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I just met with a director last week for a project, and uh, he's directed one movie. He's a commercial director, very talented man. And I watched his film, and I watched... 30 commercials he directed and I mean it's, that's what I say it's just so easy all this stuff is so available but if you go into an interview no matter what position you're in, interviewing for and you know something about the person and something that they've done in their career that you maybe like if you if you start an interview with saying hey I saw Night and Day and that's I really loved that movie that was fantastic well obviously you'd be lying because it's not a fantastic movie <laughs> but <laughs> It's least you've broken the ground there, right? And, and you, normally people go, oh, well, thank you. You know, if you're sincere, if you just go in and say, you know, I like your shoes or something. 
So, yeah, so very important, guys. You got to do a little bit of homework. I always tell you, you know, if you're going to approach somebody and ask a question or, or meet somebody, you know, have some perspective, have some insight and that makes them know that you've done a little bit of homework and that you've been thoughtful, you know, leading up to the meeting. And so actually a good example of that is a, a friend of mine interviewed with Brian Singer. I think it was for the first X-Men movie. And they spent 15 minutes talking about the shoes they were wearing when they were wearing the same shoes. And uh, he ended up doing six movies with Brian Singer. It's about making connections with people. So uh, that's a good segue while we're, you know, before we move on uh, about talking about PAs and about shoes and, you know, just about kind of, uh, you know, I've, and I've talked to a lot of you guys about footwear and about, you know, wearing proper shoes that have support like New Balance or Asics. That's a thing. But uh, just talk about, you know, uh, your expectations about PAs that are working on your team and how that what their appearance should be on the set, you know. Well, I think... Your appearance says something about you, and I think your appearance says something about the department you're working for. And I don't, I call it comedy clothing. I hate comedy clothing on sets, because we are management, assistant directors are management. So you have to have a bit of respect, not asking anyone to show up in a suit and tie. I know there is one person that shows up in a tie all the time, right? works for me. But um, it's important, you know? I, I've gone for interviews that I've got the job, and they've said, oh, that's a, that's a nice jacket you're wearing, where'd you get that? And also, there are people, for example, I worked in a movie fairly recently, uh, which was a sequel. And a couple of people weren't back, and the producer said to me, yeah, creatively, we couldn't get those people back. Look how they dressed. And you've, set, you've sent PAs home for, for wearing uh, you know, inappropriate clothing. Yeah, you, 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 know, you, you represent the company, so obviously there's a, there's a whole thing you have to sign anyway when you get on a movie that, you know, you have to wear appropriate clothing. But, you know, uh, you can't have uh, curse words on your shirt or something like that. It's, it's not the right thing to do. Good. Okay, so... Um, and I'm not asking anybody to show up, you know, like really fancy or anything. Smoking just, jacket. Just, yeah, smoking jacket and cravat. But, no, just, you know... Respect. I mean, like like you guys are here. It's like I don't see anybody and and ag and again, you know, you're you're you've you've got one of these coveted roles. If you if you're lucky enough to get one of these three or four spots as a PA, you got to like really you know do everything to keep that and 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 put your best foot forward. So that uh, goes with your appearance. And again, as I like to mention in every one of these panels, uh, also your personal hygiene. Not that every full sale student needs that note, but certainly there is a uh, stinky few that uh, need to remember that, you know, you want to be somebody that people want to be around. If I can't get within two feet of you, then, you know, we're not going to spend 18 hours together. So that's enough about that. So, um, so then uh, you, you spent five years as a PA, and then you got into the guild. And uh, once you got into the guild as a second AD, then the offers uh, started pouring in because you'd made quite a name for yourself as a PA. I did, yeah. Um, as, as I said, you know, there were, there, you, maybe you'd have one or two PAs on a movie. So by the, by the end of five years, I'd worked for a lot of assistant directors and I knew a lot of people. And once, uh, certainly in the second second position, if, you, if you're good, you're not going to stay a second second for very long. You're going to move up to a key second. So there's always jobs open for that. So once you get in the guild, then there's jobs open. And I got a lot of offers that first year. I turned down you know, in excess of 20 movies in the first year. Good problem to have. And so uh, you, you were a second AD only for about four years, and then on the movie Patriot Games, you actually uh, got like a Battlefield promotion. I did. So uh, what, was, what was that like? Were you ready for that, or uh, was it scary? I mean, were you... No, I, I had actually um, first did some non-union movies while I was a PA. Uh, so I had that experience. But obviously, it's you know that's a bit different from going from a million-dollar movie to you know Harrison Ford and the, whatever the budget was at the time, forty million dollars or something like that it was a big budget in those days. Uh, but it, the it was at the end of the movie, so I knew all of the crew, so it wasn't like I was coming into something cold, um, and I knew what to do. The first the first first AD job I ever had, I. Never had any experience like that. I went from being a PA and I got this, I got this job on a non-union movie as a second AD because I'd been a PA. And at lunchtime to me on the first day, they came and said, can you take over as the first AD? Because you're the only person here that knows what, how a set runs. Because I'd had all this experience on Blake Edwards movies and bigger movies. So the first time I was ever a first AD, I'd never 
stood beside the camera and said rolling or anything like that. And that was that I think was more nervous than Patriot Games. But it's a it's a you know it's a good lesson you know, and you guys always have to know what your boss's job is because if you are offered an opportunity like that, you want to be ready for it. So, you know, uh, even if, if you're a PA, you want to think about, okay, what is the key PA thinking about? What is the second second AD thinking about? What is the second AD thinking about? You want to really wrap your head around that because if you get an opportunity like that, you want to be able to take it. And, I mean, you know, then all of a sudden, okay, they know Matthew as here's the guy that was able to step up and do it. So it's always it, – it, you want to be prepared for that if, if you get the opportunity. And that could happen at any time. There's battlefield promotions all the time. We live in a freelance world. People move on to other shows. People – you know, we're not – we have no contract. They can fire us any moment, and we can leave at any moment. So, you know, you should always be prepared for that. So, um, so once you uh, started first thing after after Patriot Games, you know you seconded a little bit more, but then you were primarily first thing, and and uh, you know maybe because of your background with your dad, you know, or maybe it was destined, you started to kind of specialize in action movies, and uh, you you hooked up with Vic Armstrong, who was a, a guy that your dad had worked with, a big uh, second unit director. Yeah, and then um, and then your first kind of big big movie with him was Starship Troopers. Yeah. Um, I found that the best, it's, it's hard to move up from a second AD to a first AD. And uh, uh, second unit for me was the way to do it because there's less uh, pressure on the, from the studio of who to hire. Um, so yeah, I started working with Vic Armstrong. If you, if you don't know the name, you, you should look him up because he's uh, uh, a quite remarkable career. He was stunt double, he was, when you saw Indiana Jones, when you saw Superman, when you saw James Bond, it was Vic Armstrong. Just to explain to these guys briefly, I'm sure most of them understand, uh, you know, exactly what the second unit is, you know, because uh, oftentimes on these big movies, you have actually two whole separate movie crews that are kind of working parallel. So what exactly are the kind of things that the second unit uh, deals with? Well, it can be different. It depends on, on what they want the second unit to require. And... Um, nowadays it's changing somewhat because the, the directors probably a lot of you guys look up to, James Cameron and J.J. Abrams, Christopher Nolan, those type of guys, they want to shoot everything themselves. They don't want someone else shooting their movie. So it's changed a little bit. But um, it, was a, it was a really good career to, to be had, and I had it, doing these big second units. And sometimes second units can be very small, and they can be inserts and, you know, the hand picking up a water bottle or whatever it is. They have a second unit go do that. Or they can be bigger than the first unit. Um, as Larry said, Starship Troopers was my first big thing, and we shot 111 days on Starship Troopers on the second unit, and first unit shot like 102 days. So typically on the second unit, you know, you're dealing with, you don't have the actors usually, you have, you know, stunt doubles or... Yeah, the stunt doubles, and then you get the actors for certain things, as we know. As you, but, but then what happens is you get the actors to come on over and do big stunts, and then that's really pressure because you've got Tom Cruise and he's going to, you know, jump out of a plane or something. And, of course, Tom wants to really do it. And, you know, that sort of stuff, you've got to be ready and rehearsed with a stunt double. But then when the actors come over, you just put them in and you do that. So it's less dealing with, uh, with actors. Uh, and some second units, I say, can be really uh, very big. You have some pictures from Starship? Yes. Yeah, so, yeah, I was going to say one of the things that we do on second units is uh, explosions. So This was uh, uh, the biggest explosion ever done on film. And we shot in the Badlands in South Dakota. And uh, we had nine cameras on it. If you see the film, it's, uh, there's a napalm attack on bugs. And throughout this uh, this stretch here there's hundreds of bugs running and they come in and they bomb they napalm bomb the uh, the uh, uh, bugs but actually in one of those in, in a couple of those pictures you can see me standing there yeah who's that handsome fellow down in the bottom left of the uh, yes yes you see in the white shirt there just about three quarters of the way down all right I think I'm running at one point because it's getting <laughs> pretty damn close really good move and it was pretty hot but yeah uh, yeah, so when you do something like that, you've got nine camera crews and you've got the support you need for that and the uh, special effects needed for that and the visual effects needed for that, suddenly you've got a bigger crew than, than the main unit. Did you, guys, did you guys catch that? Nine cameras. So nine cameras, that's nine camera operators, nine first ACs, second ACs, 
you know, spread out all over that to capture that because, you know, something like that, you do that once. There's no, okay, reload, going again. Yeah. That's a, that's a one-time thing. So, yeah, nice explosion, buddy. How many continents have you blown stuff up on? Uh, I'm not South America yet. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm hoping to blow something up in oh, South excellent. America. Well, I'm sure they're good. looking forward to that. Be nice. <laughs> so, um, so you you started working on some second units, and then I think kind of like the next real big turning point was uh, Last Samurai. So, you know, before we start uh, talking about corralling, which is the title of this uh, here seminar, uh, you know, a big part of corralling, and I mean a huge part, and probably the biggest part is the prep. And so, you know, you've uh, you, you've started doing a lot of really interesting things for prep, including making books like this. Uh, this is this is unbelievable. This book is is something that I got the ideas to do books from because, as as Picasso said, good artists borrow and great artists steal. So I decided to steal. This was done by a gentleman called Kevin Delanoy, who's a line producer, and they'd originally done this for the battle on Braveheart. Uh, so when we got to do the battle on the last samurai, it's, it's, it takes a huge am amount of things. I mean, we we got uh, I think it was like four, five hundred extras that we flew in from Japan because we were shooting in New Zealand, but population of New Zealand is only like four or five million people. So to think you're going to get four or five hundred Asian men of the right age to go on horseback and fight battles and that didn't have jobs and everything was, was a non-starter. So they had to, we had to bring people in from Japan. So it was, it was training them with weapons and training them with all these different things. And, and uh, they, built, they built accommodation for them and then we brought in Japanese doctors and a lot of them couldn't speak English. So it was a, it was a massive... Undertaking. This book, anything. guys, this isn't for the whole movie. This is yeah. This is just for the, the last final, battle. The final battle. One sequence of the movie is this entire book. So we have a couple of uh, slides that we pulled from the book. So, um, what Kevin Delanoy did was he got in a helicopter. This was before Google was readily available, Google Maps, and took all these aerial photographs and then figured out a way of because there were so many narrow roads in this farm that we shot in, that everything didn't get clustered up and you couldn't get things to the set. So I believe there the, uh, the blue is, anything in blue is for how you get into the set for the crew, for your personal cars. And then the green was for the crew to get to the set. And the red were for the horses and the extras to get to the set. Because obviously if you've got some horses on a narrow path and they stop, everything stops. Um, this is uh, the funniest uh, terminology that I think I... Ah, the sausage factory. <laughs> <laughs> sausage factory is how uh, we got the extras ready in their samurai gear. So basically they would get picked up in a bus and they get dropped off at the top there. And they go in there. What's the first one they go in there? Catering. Catering. Yep. Of course, yeah, get fed. Uh, yeah. Right? The important thing taken care of. Breakfast burrito. Now, the only way of getting out of catering is to go in through that other other tent there, and that's where you get your costume. And everyone had a specific peg where all this stuff was, how it was, was hung up. How many extras are we talking about? It was like four or five hundred, I think. Four or five hundred in full samurai battle regalia. Right. And so then they couldn't get out of the costume unless they went through hair and makeup. And then if they needed prosthetics, if they had a wound or something, they'd go over to the side right there. Yep. And then they'd go into the next tent, and they'd get their armor and their props. And then they'd get on their horse and they'd ride to the set. So they'd come in as regular 20th century at the time people and they'd come out the other end of the tent as samurai. So you guys can see, that, I mean, the level of preparation that is necessary. And I always, I tell you guys, you know, you don't have time to figure stuff out on the day. And I mean, certainly you can imagine if 400 people showed up and there wasn't a very, you know, specific plan, then it, it, it would take 12 hours to get them ready, you know, and so right. that doesn't work. You know, this is daylight stuff. You're constrained by the sun. The sun goes away and you're done. So, I mean, it has to be, everything has to be planned out to this detail for this kind of sequence. And I, I would say in general, no matter what project you're doing, if you're, doing, if you're making your own movie on, a, on your iPhone, whatever it is, an hour of rehearsal is worth three hours on the set. Write that down. And anything you can do, and that doesn't just apply to acting, although it is important, it's anything you can prep, anything you can talk about, 
anything you can figure out beforehand. And even if you go in with the greatest plan, with every I dotted and every T crossed, it's still going to be messed up. But at least you have a plan to try and aim at, and everybody's on the same page. This is this is what we're looking at now. Is is Kevin went so far as to detail how the costumes had to be hung up at night because they'd get wet, so they needed to dry overnight. So he had this this. Uh, in the bottom there, he has the hose there that's got the warm air, and they hang their costumes up over the hose, and then, so the costumes dry overnight. So they come in the next day, they get in the dry costume. Talk about preparation. This is a schematic for how we're going to hang up clothes. So I mean, you know, you want, you need to have every detail planned out when you're when you're trying to do an undertaking like this. Cool. So um, let's talk about night and day. One of the ones that ah, we worked on together. Yes. So that was, uh, you know, a classic personal, you know, career highlight for me. Uh, you know, got to live in Boston for a couple months and got to live in uh, Spain for a couple months. And, um, you know, the when Matthew first uh, called me to tell me about it, he said that, you know, we're going to recreate the running of the Bulls and that uh, in Spain. And I said, OK, cool. And, you know, just to show you guys how that starts. This is our friend uh, Brian Smurs, the second unit director. Now, this is this is a man I've done 13 movies with, and, he, and I do believe he's a genius. And he basically will be given an action sequence, and that's this is how it starts with toys, you know, with cars or whatever. This he's got a toy ball there, look, and a motorbike. But that's how it starts, and from that, they would then create a previs. So um, yeah, and. And then, you know, Matthew as a first AD will we'll take the script, and here's this, uh, we'll, we're not going to talk about the running of the bull sequence, but we're going to talk about the uh, Boston chase sequence. So Matthew, you know, takes a, a script, the script pages here, and you can see, you know, uh, in the sequence, uh, Cameron Diaz is in the car, and then the guy jumps out of the car, and then Tom Cruise rides up on his motorcycle, and he, you know, jumps off the motorcycle and jumps from cars and stuff. And so... Uh, as many of you student ADs have seen, you know, then uh, Matthew will take it and we'll, we'll break it down in movie magic. And uh, you can see some of the elements that we're dealing with. Uh, you know, we have our cast, which are the, you know, the stunt doubles. And, and every stunt double, uh, you know, that has to do an action, they're, they're in, in SAG, even if they have non-speaking roles. And then uh, some of the other elements that we use, you know, we have uh, stunt drivers, who do the dangerous things that are really close to the action. And then we have, uh, it's, they're called precision drivers. There's one company called Bill Young Precision Drivers. And these are uh, a step below stunt drivers, but a step above extras, you know, because sometimes we just have extras driving cars and they don't have any training at all. Bill Young drivers have some, uh, some, some training in, uh, in precision driving. We wouldn't put them, having them doing anything besides just normal driving, but we know that at least they have a brain and they, you know, are able to follow instructions, supposedly. Supposedly, yeah. So, uh, you know, as I've told you guys, when you're breaking down a script, you know, as you're reading the script, questions will come up and you need to, you know, mark things down that you want to go back for and you want to, you know, have sidebars with different departments about. So you can see that when Matthew was breaking down the script, uh, you know, that every time a question came up, he would, he would include it in his schedule so that, so that he can follow up on it later. So that's, you know, the script becomes the breakdown sheets. The breakdown sheets become the schedule. And meanwhile, you know, Brian Smurz is working to create a previs. And, you know, you guys, uh, you guys can make um, animatics. And I encourage you guys to make animatics with your phones. And you, what it is is, you know, you do the exact shots and cut it together and see if it's going to work. So this is how we plan this sequence. You know, it's all done in previs. And this, you can see that on the top, it actually says the lens sizes that we're going to use. And then we do this plan. We have this previs each day, and we watch it. And these are the shots that we do. And if you, you, know, you watch the final movie, you'll see that it is exactly this. So if you look at the top there, there's a, uh, what happens with a previs, I, I think this is, is this backwards? No, there's a, there's a number. Each time the shot changes, the, the, uh, the number of the shot changes. Some of these have been reversed, so they're backwards. But so that's what I would do. Rather than schedule a, a scene, I would schedule shots in, in an action sequence. So some of this would be with Tom and Cameron, like that would be Cameron in the car. This would be Tom riding a motorbike. And he 
suddenly he disappears on the motorbike, motorbike smashes into the water, and he lands on the hood, and he says, hey, June, that's a nice dress. And he's getting shot at, and they get into this gunfight with Tom on top of the car. So, majoritively, this would be second unit. A shot like that might be first unit. Once we see their faces, then we're talking about the real actors. But all this, all this stuff was actually done with Tom on second unit. He came out and did all this with us. Um, so here, watch this. You guys pay attention to this part right here and remember that in a couple of moments. This right here. Ah. I actually think it's that one. Oh, that's one, yeah. You're right. All right, so they chase and they chase, and I think they go into the tunnel now. Okay. Which is, is, it goes on forever and ever. But I get something like that, right? So I get this little mini film, and then I break it down into each shot, and each shot that's what would be required for each shot. So you can see, you know, the... So maybe, uh, may, could we go back to that for one second and just maybe look at one shot? Just pick one shot. From the previous? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Oh, no, we can't. No, we can't. All no, right. yeah. <laughs> All right, so like for an example, this shot. Now, that looks pretty simple, right? You just stop and go back to that one, right? Just the shot of them going over the bridge. That looks like a pretty simple shot. But that's a real bridge, and it's a shot from a helicopter, and the helicopter is low. And FAA rules is that no one can be within 500 feet of the helicopter. So now that creates a problem. How do you do that? You're 500, you've got the helicopter's 500 feet away. You have to lock up everything you see there, and you have to put your own cars on the bridge. And you have to lock up the water, make sure no boats are there. You'll lock up those buildings, mm -hmm. nobody in any of those buildings. Mm -hmm. And guess what? Hey, that Zaken Bridge is really a busy place, so the only time you can do it is between 3 p.m. and 3.15 p.m. on Sunday. So that's the real bridge. So we, want, we don't want to just try and do that once. We want to do it twice, at least in that 15 minutes. But once you get off of this bridge, you have to go so far on this freeway to turn around to go back to, for another take that you're going to be out of time. So we need two sets of cars. So it's 50 cars, 25 on one end, 25 on another end, and then another bunch of 25 and another 25. And at 3 o'clock, you're going to close down that Actually, you can see there, at the very bottom there is a tunnel. The, 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 the freeway comes out of the tunnel there, right there. So we've got 50 cars inside that tunnel, and we've got 50 cars going towards the tunnel on the other end of the bridge. And Larry's on the other end of the bridge, and I'm in the tunnel, and the helicopter's up in the air with the director, and I'm talking to Larry, and I'm talking to the helicopter pilot, and I'm talking to the extras, and guess what? We plan everything, everything's perfect. I go in the tunnel, helicopter can't hear me but a radio. So now I'm on the cell phone, talking to the helicopter pilot, talking to him. But so as I said, you can plan everything, still gonna go wrong in a day, so you gotta be light on your feet and think about it, and, you know? But, so for that in opening shot, you go, oh yeah, okay, so they drive on the bridge, but it's maybe a half a day's work. You know, you gotta figure out where do all the cars park before you get them in that tunnel? You don't have time to get them all from the parking lot. <laughs> You know, how do they get to the other side of the bridge? All those things, that's the assistant director's job. The director wants to come there, says, OK, let's see it. All right, I want to do another one. That's what he wants to do once he's told me what he wants to see. And then our job is to figure out the mechanics of that. And that's one of the things I really like about the job, because that is creative. You know, everybody, most people in life, I think, want to do something creative with their life and have a creative job. And I'm sure everybody in this room feels the same. And there are very few producer, director, writer jobs. But if you can make some creative creativity in your own job, and, and part of my job is to help creative people create, you know, to give them that space. And this is creative to do all of this stuff, you know, because it, it does take some thinking outside of the box. And some of this stuff is that we have done together is not necessarily industry standard stuff. When we go on scouts, you should show. We give, we give the, the crew like a, a book of what we're doing, you know, which has got the frame grabs in it from the previs, and uh, there's a, uh, 
Let's see, there's some maps and all of that. So they know exactly when we go there, they can make notes and they've got everything and there's pull out maps and everything. And here's, here's one of the things that will be in it. It's got my notes on it. But like, so shot 0460 is going one way. We know that's going in that street, but shot 332 is going in the other direction because I've gone on with the, the director on the scout and he says, well, this piece of road will work for this shot. I got to write all that down and then we put it into some kind of a document on that. So we're there on the day and they say, all right, we're going to do shot 332 next. Everybody can look at their book and they say, all right, the car's going this way on 332. So, you know, I've told you guys a lot of prep is arts and crafts. And, you know, if you can create documents that can, you know, convey to everybody what's going on, as I've explained to you, a big part of our job is nobody shows up on the set and says, what are we doing? We, get, we provide the information so that everybody knows what we're doing. And you can look at this document, and you can see there's an actual satellite image of what we're shooting, and here's you know, an illustration of it, and everybody should be able to look at this and get on the same page. So that's a, a big part of our job. And you know, when Matthew was talking about uh, you know, where the cars were going to stage and all that stuff. You know, the, the, the ADs don't figure that stuff out, but we ask the questions. It's a collaboration. So who do you think we're going to ask about where the cars are going to park? locations department, right? The locations department, they know the area. They're talking to the local people. You know, we, we're talking with the police, but, you know, it's a collaboration. And, and, and a lot of it is knowing who to ask for what. But we're the ones that ask those questions and get the, get the dialogue started. So here's some flying Tom. Remember I told you... Let's uh, look at the rigs first. I think that would be, that would be a bit... Th so there's a thing where Tom jumps and he lands on the other car, right? So how do we do that? How does he, how's he drive down the street on one car, on top of one car, and then on the other car? So we built this rig that would be attached to a car that Tom could stand on. So as he was driving down the street, the rig is, uh, the rig is attached to it, and he's standing on there. Right, oh, that's, that's the car crash, we'll go back to that. But um, yeah, so there's the rig. And he would stand up there and he would be then cabled in. We show the picture of Tom. Mm -hmm. So here's Tom actually doing it. So this car is, is driving 40 miles an hour and Tom Cruise is attached to the car. That's and the he is cabled in, he is, he's wearing a, a harness and he's cabled in from his chest to the roof of the car. So, if he doesn't land on the car, he's going 40 miles an hour on the freeway, guys. If he doesn't land on the car, he's going to fall off the car, but at least he's not going to go into the road and get run over. So there's the platform. You can see we tested it. We test everything. Everything is tested. Before we get there on the day, it's tested and retested, and the actor tests it. And uh, you can see this was you know, early on in the uh, figuring out how to do it, but you can see the platform you know, it, it remained pretty much the same thing that we used. And I, I think something, you know, n not everybody is going to work on big action movies. And some of you will, may work on, on smaller independent movies or whatever it is. But uh, the thing with, with this sort of thing, and, and there are stunts and stuff on lower, movie, lower budget movies, of course, is it can't be rushed. There's one thing, you, you, can, be, you can be a day behind on, a, on an acting scene and you can catch up in a day. You know, you can devise the coverage that you can catch up. But with action... You can't rush this stuff because it it's, looks cool and all that, but it's extremely dangerous. I, wanna, I want you to explain a couple of uh, terms to these guys that they might hear at some point down the, the road, uh, a ratchet or a cannon. Right, it's well, this is, this is a good example of a cannon. And it, we actually saw this piece in the previs. It's where the car flipped over. He fires the gun, the car flips over and goes down. So, and you can actually see this is being filmed by another vehicle, that black vehicle in the, in the background there uh, as, a, as a crane arm on it. And that's what it's being filmed from. You've, you've heard, you guys have heard uh, of the Russian arm or the ultimate arm or the edge. Or it's, there's a lot of uh, weird uh, divorce happening in that family, but it's all basically the same technology from these Russian guys. So a cannon, and actually this might have been a ratchet. Yeah, I think wow. this, one, this one was a ratchet. This, no one right. was in that. Right, because I see the dummy coming out in the next uh, picture. You can actually see the dummy fell out of the car Oops. When, we, uh, when we did it. But... Um, a cannon is basically that. It's, it's, a, it's a cannon that's put in the, in the car, and the cannon fires into the ground. It's a tube that fires into the ground that yeah, the lifts, lifts the car up. So this one's a ratchet, and... Right, and a ratchet is, is um, it's not driven, right? It's, that's so it's, a cannon. 
There is a cannon, right? That's a far away cannon, mm -hmm. as you can see. And there's also a gasoline bomb in there as well. So they, so that's tied in. So they will hit the driver will hit a button that will release the cannon, and at the same time the explosion will go off and the car will flip up. It's and a it's, it's a cylinder actually that shoots out of the bottom of the car like a cannon, and that's and the driver it's a guy driving it. He'll get the car sideways, hit the button, and the cylinder flies out of the bottom, and it's not attached, so the cylinder goes skidding off down the road. So you have to make sure that there's nobody standing behind it, and the car starts to flip. <clears throat> the ratchet, there's nobody driving the car, and it's just some kind of a, a hydraulic or a pneumatic thing that just right. and it can be, you know, car. it can be one to four or one to twenty or whatever speed you want to do, so you can speed it up. But and then and then this other one of the motorbike that was when Tom was driving up on the uh, uh, and flew off the motorbike and landed on the on the uh, hood of the car. So and that actually the, there's the ultimate arm. There's the ultimate arm there, yeah. Um, so that was, go back to that other picture for a sec. That, uh, almost. Um, motorcycle. That's the place where we did it. And there was no, the, water, the motorcycle uh, landed in the water. There was no water. That was all CG water when you see the film. And then Tom landing on the hood of the car was done in a separate element. And the motorbike swinging, this is actually swinging from a crane. So we were driving along the street, and there was a crane to our right there, a very tall construction crane with this motorbike that was flung from the crane and released. They, they, pull, the, they pull the bike back, and they let it go. And you know the special effects department are so dialed in that they know exactly the, when it's going to be released, and they can tell us it's going to land here. And it lands exactly where they say it's going to land. That was a good special effects department. Yeah. So that was... Uh, that was a fun experience. On so yeah, it's it, that sort of thing. A lot of it is elements. You may be, there may be three or four elements to one of those shots that you saw. So it takes it takes a long time to shoot something. I don't know. I don't remember how long we took to shoot that sequence, but it was a couple weeks. Yeah, for sure. Two or three weeks, I think. Yeah. So uh, let's uh, move on to uh, Rise of the Planet of the Apes. Right. So this is uh, you know Matthew made another production book for Rise of the Planet of the Apes, and uh, specifically, which, uh, which the sequence that you worked on? I actually did one sequence. There was a second unit on Rise of the Planet of the Apes, and I did a different sequence from that. I did the Golden Gate Bridge sequence. At the end of Rise of the Planet of the Apes, all the apes are trying to get to Muir Woods and escape the humans, and they go over the, the, the Golden Gate Bridge, and the police try and stop them, and there's a, there's a big uh, fight there. And the helicopter crashes on the bridge and all of that. So what happened was uh, we were given the previous of this, this is the director again, Brian Smurz, and he's director of photography, Larry Blanford. And we go out to the parking lot where we are going to build a small section of the Golden Gate Bridge. This is in Vancouver. And they're going to build like a quarter of a mile of the bridge. So we figure out exactly where it needs to be. It's just an empty parking lot. And then we got some cars out there. I think these were our rental cars, and we just put them out there. See <laughs> how, many, how many cars is it actually going to take to fill this thing up? And so then the next thing I do, having seen the previous, is I had the art department make a model of the bridge and got out our toy cars and figured out that we want the bridge to look, you know, a mile long, but we only have a quarter of a mile of set. So we want to do it, um, you know, in sections. We want to do the front section of the bridge, the middle section of the bridge, the end section of the bridge, and then the bit where the... Bit where the um, they push a bus and then a, and a helicopter comes down and crashes. So once we figure out all of this, I take these very fuzzy photographs and gave them to the art department uh, that then turn it into a schematic that goes in our little booklet. So we know on day one, this is how the extras cars have to be on the bridge. And then on day two, the start of the day, that's how the cars need to be set up. And on day four or whatever it is, that's how the cars need to be set up. And then when we crash, the helicopter, we're going we're gonna to move a section of the, the railing at the side to the middle of the bridge and cheat it so we can crash the helicopter in the middle of the bridge. But on the movie, it looked like at the side of the bridge. An interesting thing about this, or maybe it's not an interesting thing, I think it's an interesting thing, is that when we started this movie, the plan was to have no real helicopter there. They were going to do an all-CG helicopter. And I believe that um, visual effects work the best when it's uh, married with real stuff. So if you've got 
real, 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 visual effect, real, real, looks much better than everything visual effect. We're all, you know, we're sophisticated now. We see movies, we say, oh, that's visual effects, who cares? Right? Um, so they wanted to use a visual effects helicopter. And we said, wait, we think we can get helicopters to do this. Now, there's probably seven or eight helicopter pilots in the world that can do this, but they are the guys that you use. We just had one on the last movie I did. He landed a, a Huey in a, in a little street in Macon in the middle of the night. Um, and, you know, you're not getting the local guy to do that. You're getting one of these five or six guys to do this. But we actually got a real helicopter to do, to do all of this stuff. And I think it really shows in the, in the film that it's, it sells it more. So while, while we're uh, – anybody here think that that sequence actually happened on the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco? No, didn't it? Not didn't one. Know. One person, I saw you. Let it ah. go. Uh, so, um, you know, I do want to touch on uh, safety on set. You know, obviously a very tragic thing happened last year in Georgia on the, uh, on the Allman Brothers movies. And, you know, um, having worked on so many movies with Matthew and, you know, we had a train in night and day with, uh, you know, two trains coming in and Tom Cruise driving through the middle. And, you know, we've both worked on, on trains on, on other projects. It's really uh, unconscionable and, uh, you know, as an AD, uh, can't believe that they let that happen. So, I mean, uh, you know, um, if you guys ever see something unsafe on set, you know, wh no matter what your role is, you're allowed to bring attention to it. And, you know, if, if somebody's asking you to do something dangerous, I mean, so many things went wrong with that, you know. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing is, is you got to look out for yourself, right? I mean, yes, we, we're here to look after everybody's safety, but uh, you don't know who the ADs are. You know, everybody should be so, somewhat responsible on set when it comes to safety. If you see th something, and I always say this to the crews anyway, when I start a movie, or at the beginning of the day, you have to have the safety meeting anyway. If you see anything, you think I'm safe, come and talk to me, no matter how busy I look, because that's a huge part of our job. We are responsible for the safety, you know, and, and that's, you're doing this sort of stuff, it's, it's paramount. So, uh, yeah, another um, really cool thing that Matthew does that I haven't seen any other AD do is uh, every morning, especially on the, uh, on, the, on the big stunt and action units, we'll take five or ten minutes and get everybody together in the catering tent. And, you know, we have that previs, and we'll pull the clips of what we're shooting that day and sit everybody down and explain to everybody, although we've prepped and everybody should know what's happening and have a call sheet, We'll sit everybody down and explain to them exactly what's going on and make sure that everybody's on the same page. So I think that's a really smart idea. Would, do you do that on your, on your more narrative uh, projects as well? Or? Well, you know, as I said, you do need to have a safety meeting. It's, it's the law re you require to have a safety meeting at the beginning of every day. And, and, you know, if you were shooting in this room and we had two cameras, what's our safety meeting really going to be? It's going to be, well, look, there's a the trouble, there's the door, right? That's the safety meeting. Don't trip over any cables. But you've got everybody together, so go through the work. You know, hey, we're going to start today, we're going to be in this room, and then we're going to move out into the hallway, and while we're out in the hallway, they're going to change these screens over, and we'll come back after lunch. Oh, and there's the door, the exit. You need to get out and don't trip over any cables. There's your safety meeting. Now everybody's spent five, meetings in a safe, five minutes in a safety meeting, but they know what's happening during the day. And I think and any, any project you do, if people know what's going on, they're going to appreciate it, and they're going to work harder, and you're going to get more out of them. So... Um we are and also, if you can make them laugh a couple of times a day, that helps too, because you're there a long time. So if you're not too serious about it, you can... He's a funny guy. So not yes, today, but... Yeah. We, <laughs> we'll have a safety meeting, you know, <coughs> generally at the beginning of the day, and then if we're going to do any of these types of stunts, a ratchet, a cannon, uh, you know, anything dangerous, we'll stop no matter where we are during the day, and we'll have another safety meeting, and that, you know, will be noted on the production report, and that way, if anything happens, uh, you know, God forbid, we, we have a record of the fact that we stopped and we explained to everybody what was going on. And, you know, if it's a, in the case of one of those cannons, you know, there's a lot of different departments that are involved. You have the stunt department and they're driving the cars. You have the special effects department and they're the ones that make the explosions. You know, the locations department, you have police who have an ambulance standing by. If it's one of those cannon cars, we have the jaws of life that we have to actually contract for that day that will be standing by. We have a, a, a transportation driver in a construction vehicle sitting in the vehicle that will drive in once we cut and that will flip the car back over. So before we do something dangerous like that, we want to make sure everyone knows what their role is. Hey, 
construction driver, where are you going to be? Sitting in your car, engine in, in the vehicle, engine running over there. Set medic, you're going to be here. Paramedics are here. Jaws of life are warmed up. So, you know, uh, before we do any sequence like that, we'll stop and have another safety meeting. And, you know, if you guys are, you know, that's a good thing for you guys to practice as well. You know, even if it's a little stun or whatever you're trying to do, you want to stop. And that in those cases, it's, it's okay to put the brakes on and you're saving yourself, you know, time or possibly, you know, something dangerous happening. So, you know, we push and we go and we go and efficient, efficient, go, 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 shoot, shoot, shoot. But that's not to say, you know, you ever compromise uh, safety or anything like that. No, I mean, you, you push in the right areas. If the people you can't push, you, if someone's, you know, setting a bomb, you can't push that person. They're setting a bomb, right? You know, and it just takes that time. And, and as I said earlier, you, you just can't rush anything. Anything that's... The reason you have stuntmen is because it's somewhat dangerous. So even even on the smallest movie with a near miss or something, you got a stuntman there, it's dangerous. You should have a stuntman there anyway. So uh, we're almost out of time, but I just want to briefly uh, talk about This Means War mm. and, uh, you know, kind of how uh, what, what my role becomes in that as the second AD because, you know, Matthew will and Ma Matthew and I will scout the location and then we'll determine that there are places that we need to stop people or, you know, this is uh, this big chase sequence that we did and this means war and this is actually uh, San Pedro in LA. You can see here is the uh, aquarium. Long Beach. Isn't it? Long Beach Aquarium, you're right, yeah, Long Beach. And uh, so um, when I went to talk to the producers about additional PAs that I needed that day, I can't go to, uh, you know, a line producer or a UPM and say, hey, I need 50 PAs. Why? Well, because we need lockups. No, you can't have that. So I come in with a document like this, and I say, okay, here's, here's a Google image that I pulled, and here's intersection one, and here's a, a blow-up of intersection one, and there's four corners of intersection one. Here's intersection two. Here's another four places where I need people. And now I've come in prepared and armed, and if the UPM says no, I say, okay, you tell me where I don't have a PA. And now if something dangerous or horrible happens, I am, you know, I've done my due diligence. And how can they say no? There's always a way to get the answer to be yes if you come in prepared and dialed in. And it's a visual business. Any visual aid you can get. You know, it's crazy. You work on, you can work on $100 million movies and people are drawing little stick figures on pieces of paper and you've got so much of this stuff is available. And anything you can, you can do with visual aids really it helps people. Arts, arts and crafts, guys. I arts mean, I, crafts, I yeah. really, uh, you know, you have to learn how to, you have to know how to use your computers. You know, I mean, these were just created. All I did was uh, take a Google Earth image and I import it into Microsoft Word and put these, uh, you know, text boxes and stars and stuff. There's definitely probably a way more efficient way to do that, but I was able to do that and to, uh, you know, to communicate what we needed for that day. So you guys have to, you know, be literate with technology and be able to figure out how to create documents that will explain to people uh, what you're looking for. Cool, so uh, I think we can go ahead and uh, open it up to any questions, if anybody has any questions. Dion? Oh, yeah. How's it going? My name's uh, Dion McCarter, I'm a film major. Hi, Dion. Um, my question is, uh, when working overseas on a film like Night and Day in Spain, uh, how do you bridge the cultural gap when working with international crews? Because um, everything's different. So uh, how yeah. would you do that? Well, first thing I, I do when I go to a new country is find out what their local laws are, you know, because that's, that, that's a big thing in terms of crews. You know, like, for example, uh, I shot a movie in Bulgaria, and I, I said that question, you know. Is there anything I... Nope, nothing. And then a couple of days before we started shooting, oh, there is one thing. Uh, the crew have a 10-hour turnaround every day. Well, that's a big deal. So you have to figure out those things and those, those things. Culturally, um, you know, I think you, you have to be a bit uh, more careful with pushing. I, I, I'm not a shouter and a screamer, but, you know, I'm, I get things done. And Wait, you go to well, somewhere... Wait, last thing? Uh, no, this is a shout. Okay, okay. <laughs> Maybe a shout, not a scream. <laughs> um, but... Uh, uh, Culturally, um, you totally put me off now. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> He's loud. He's not a screamer. No. Um, no, is to get the, is to get their things is is to obviously is a language thing. Uh, the great thing about Spain is is we had a guy that worked with us all the time in LA that was Spanish, 
and was from Barcelona, I think, right? And so he worked on the movie in Boston and then came over and was an AD in Spain. So we had a, I had someone sort of on the inside, even though I'd, I had Spanish ADs working for me. And, and it's a bit different overseas is because a lot of the times, especially when there's a language barrier, I'm just telling the Spanish first AD. I'm making the calls, but hey, we're going to do this next. And then he s s lets him run it, you know? So even though he does work under me, I always try and keep that as a mutual thing that we're kind of equal, you know? Although I'm the person dealing with the director and all of that. And that's, that's probably the best way to deal with it is because you will always have a match. If you go somewhere like Canada, Australia, New Zealand, you won't have a match. But in most of those countries, you will have an equal from that country. I was does kind of work. For you. I was worried about that too. You know, I was like, oh, now there's going to be a Spanish second AD. How is how is that going to work? But you know, you you can't be like uh, protective of your role. Like it's my job. You know, it, you have to collaborate. And <clears throat> as it turned out, it was a really great collaboration. And, and you know, they they fit right in with us and they helped us. And it was uh, it was you know it was very it, it was a great relationship and still friends with those guys now. Yeah, I think you just make them part of a team. I think if you, if there's a separation, it's not going to work. You know, but it's the same with everything. It's it's teamwork. If you get everybody on the same page, it's going to go better. And know? we needed their help. I mean, we couldn't have done it oh. without them. And uh, so it was uh, it, it ended up being a great relationship. We have a question from online from Austin. Is it difficult? His name is Austin, or is it in Austin? He's, he, I don't know where he yeah, is, okay. but his name is Austin. Okay. <laughs> you are not in Austin. Hi, Austin. <clears throat> uh, is it difficult as a second unit director to match the style of the first unit? I think, I think it's, that's why there are so few top second unit directors, because I think it's very difficult. I think some people, uh, there's a lot of frustrated directors in the world, and uh, some of them happen to be stuntmen that get to direct second units, or other people that direct second units. And it is, it is, that's why someone like Brian Smurz and Vic Armstrong are the guys, because they can fit that style, fit into that style. You know? And I think sometimes it's, it's much harder to be a second unit director if you're, if you're directing a lot of the stuff, because you, you are not doing it in your natural own style of what you'd want to do. You have to always think for the other director. So I think there's few, few people that are really good at it. Sarah. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Sarah Gorris. I'm Hi, with Sarah. the film program. Um, what kind of communication happens between the director and the AD? Like, what kind of communication is the positive thing that you need as an AD to do your job? And then what's n the negative things that, you know, cause problems for you to complete your job effectively? Um, Negative things with the director you're asking about. <coughs> um, uh, I think that the thing with the director is, I go in, my viewpoint is I'm assistant director, you know? I love the movie business. I love the history of the movie business. Assistant directors are there for the director. Even though they have many bosses, that's their ultimate director. So I really want to have a good relationship with them and work on that. And, and you know, we spend a lot of time together in prep. Um, one of the things I'll do is, is, the first thing I'll do is I'll prepare a schedule and then I'll go through that schedule with the director each day uh, with a script, just me and him in a room and say, well, are you comfortable with this day? Oh, that's too much. Now I can fit more on that day just to get a kind of an idea of what he wants. Um, and just really be looking out for him because I actually believe that the director's job is the hardest job on the movie set. And they got so many people coming at them all day long with so many questions, and there's so much pressure to because it's a business. You, you, you know, it's great. You hear these stories of people going 50 days over, 60 days over. It's not really like that. You got to finish on schedule. Most directors want to finish on schedule, so you're their collabor collaborator in that. You know, so it's I always try and uh, get on some sort of a as soon as I can, some sort of personal thing that we've got together. And that can be anything, you know? As I say about films, it's like you're working with people that probably love films. If you know your films, the last two movies I did with uh, Dawn of the Planet of the Apes with Matt Reeves and The Fifth Wave with Jay Blakes and probably the last three or four weeks of both of those movies, the director and I's conversation would be this. Hey, what's your favorite James Stewart film? Tell me after we get this take. You know, it's that, it's that thing, you've got that rapport with them. And if they know that you're looking out for them. And another thing I, I do like to do is, if there's a problem, 
A lot of times as an AD, you're going to find out about it before the director finds out about it. So I think it's a really good thing to do if you <laughs> go and tell the director, hey, there's a problem, but here's a couple of solutions that might work. And then let make him make the decision. But at least you're not coming to him with just another person with a question he's got to deal with. You're trying to help him out. The negative thing, I suppose, would be um, if he doesn't like you. <laughs> I don't know. If there was a personal thing. Uh, I've been very lucky with the guys I've worked with. I've always got along with them, and they've been great. But, um, you know, it's personal relationships like any, any business. It's, it's personal relationships are really important in a freelance business, you know, because that's how you're going to get your work and how you're going to keep working. Matthew makes a good point, though, about, you know, speaking the language of film. And, you know, you guys need to, all of you guys need to bone up a little bit on your film history and about, you know, classic movies. And, you know, if it was me and Matthew just said, what's your favorite James Stewart movie? Let's talk about it after the take. I would be Googling James Stewart movies right now, probably. But, you know, it's those uh, kind of things. What's that? Go watch Harvey. <clears throat> Harvey's a good one. But you guys need to, you know, you're going to need to, the people in movies speak the language of movies. And so some of you guys' uh, knowledge of movie history is lacking, and you need to know where it came from to know where it's going. And you also need to be able to speak that language you know, with people that have been in the business for 20 or 30 years. So uh, that's something that you need to, uh, to work on. Well, so when, when we work with McGee, I mean, every reference is another film. He knows every film. And you know, you should know what he's talking about. You can't go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs> I have no idea, because it's, it's what your job is. So until you see every movie ever made, but, you know, it helps if you, if you know that stuff. Start with the AFI top 50, you know. Yeah, exactly, you know, right. You yeah. know, you should, there's no reason that you guys in this room should not have seen every one of those movies on that AFI top 50 or whatever, you know. So start now. Jessica? Oh. Hold on, we're going to get you a uh, microphone. There? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She's very loud. You're very loud, okay. I used to be a tour guide, so. Ah, okay. Um, what's the hardest location you've ever had to film at? Oh, God. Um, I have to say, uh, I, I mean, Starship Troopers is very difficult. Um, but probably on Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, we shot in the forest, and we shot in British Columbia in April. And I said to Matt Reeves, well, it's going to rain the whole time. He said, I know. <laughs> and that was great while we were sitting in an office. In the first week, he went through seven pairs of gloves. He wasn't happy in the rain. But it was, it was very, very difficult. We were shooting in, in British Columbia in a place called Golden Ears Park. And uh, uh, it rained nonstop. And part of our set flooded and floated away. And uh, it, was, it was really difficult. I mean, it, was, it just rained the whole time. And because we shot with the Alexa M, uh, had to, the camera had to be tethered the whole time. So the, the brain of the camera could never be further than a thousand feet away from the body of the camera. And so when you're shooting in the forests on, you know, like a slope like that, and it's pouring with rain, and you can't identify anyone because everyone's in rain gear and all you see is that, <laughs> it was pretty miserable. But it was worth it. We knew it was going to be worth it. But it, it was tough. I've, I've mentioned to all of you guys, you know, to make sure that you have good wet gear and you know you need to when you're shooting a location the first thing you do when you wake up is look at the weather because there's nothing worse than getting stuck at seven in the morning with the wrong gear and it's for the next 13 or 14 hours so you guys need to invest in in good rain gear in waterproof shoes uh sooner than later especially working here in florida where uh it can be pretty terrible uh jillian Hi, I'm Julian Campbell, uh, Film Missouri. Uh, so since you went from a PA all the way up to a first AD, dealing with all the difficult experiences that you have, what do you do to keep calm, cool, and collected? Do I keep calm, cool, and collected? Oh, no, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you do. All right, yeah. <laughs> it makes you seem very calm, though. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's a good question. I have to think about it for a second. Let me see. Um, I think the, I mean, the level of preparation going into it to be, to be so dialed in. To, I mean, he's got an encyclopedic knowledge of what we're working on. Uh, the way that his brain works, it, it, you know, it's, it's always been so impressive to me that he's got the whole movie, like, in his head. Like, even every one of those 
you know, shots that came through the previs, he can be like, oh, shot 360 is in his you know, you know what's sad is I, is I look at that now and I still recognize the numbers. <laughs> and that's five, six years ago. But to answer your question, um, now it's, I think it's the experience that doesn't let it get to me because I've been doing it for a long time. Um, I think you have to have somewhat of a thick skin to get through it because the worst you will get treated in your career is when you're a PA because there are certain people that will just... You know, they're angry or whatever, and they don't like they don't like young people or whatever it is. I don't know, but that that's, that that can be probably the hardest because you've got no nowhere to go with it. You know what I mean? You can't sort of say well. You have to you have to have a thick skin. Uh, you know, uh, mentioned it yesterday in the uh, internship lecture, but you know the good thing about working freelance is that it's always it's always going to end. Well, so, that's true. Yeah. You know, 20 more wake-ups, and then I never have to deal with this a-hole right. again. You know? But so. it's also, it's like, it, to me, I think it was probably more of a, a motivator. It's like, oh, yeah, well, I'll show you. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, you wait. And believe me, there's names I still remember. It's like, and I've said to people, you remember me when I was a PA? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> I remember, yeah. <laughs> you will, uh, in your careers, you know, you will uh, meet people and, you know, not everybody's personality goes along with everybody's. And no matter how great you are and how good you are at your job, there are going to be people that just don't like you and that you just don't get along with. And, uh, you know, that's the reality of it. And, you know, luckily all the jobs end and, you know, you have a thick skin. And, you know, I used to, when I was getting screamed at and abused, not by this guy, but by other first ADs, like screamed at and abused, you know, I just would think to myself, well, you're not going to hit me, you know, so I'm not worried about that. And the worst thing that happens is you're going to fire me. So keep it, you know, I don't care. Keep yelling at me. It's fine. And, you know, they didn't fire me and they made it through and got off that show. And now there's a list of people that, you know, they're probably not going to call me. But if they did, you know, I would say no thanks. And so you just, you just got to have a thick skin. Uh, anybody have a real, one quick last question? This gentleman. No, that's going to be the last one. Hello, uh, my name is Courtney Willer. I'm in the Hi, program. Uh, I just want to know uh, how difficult was it to become a member of the Guild? Ah, it was, it was actually very difficult in those days. It's changed considerably since I joined the Guild. Um, in those days, you needed 400 days, and I got them all as a PA. And as I said, there was only one or two PAs working on a movie, and the, the DJ were really, really against it at the time. So it was, a, it was a long struggle, and I had to get lawyers involved and all that. But again, it's like, hey, I want to do this, and nobody's going to stop me. You know, it's if I'm going to do it, I'm, they're going to give up before I'm going to give up. There's, uh, there's several different avenues to get in, and you know, if you go to their website, you can get their contract administration on the phone, and they you know, are uh, more than happy to explain to you the different routes. And uh, you know, if you want to make an appointment to see me, I'll be happy to talk it over the different, the different roads to do it, but it's not, it, they make it difficult. It's, uh, it's, it's not easy. But I, w I would say, in general, it's, it's, you know, it's a great job, but it's hard and you work a lot of hours and it's long. And if, if any of you are thinking of getting into it, you gotta love it. Because if you don't love it, it's not gonna work out for you. You have to have a passion for it. And, and if you don't have that passion, there's nothing wrong with you, you're not doing anything wrong, you will be saving yourself a lot of time to not do it. Because you're not gonna be ma making a lot of money to start with. You know, so so if, if you wanna do it, be passionate. And I'm all for that. And I encourage every one of you to go for it if you're passionate. But if you don't really have that, it's probably not for you. The, you know, the, the hours that we're talking about, that's the reality. The working conditions, that's the reality. So, uh, you know, really fun, amazing job. But yes, you know, if you're not passionate about it, there are plenty of eight-hour jobs that you don't have to go slogging through the mud, uh, you know, uh, in the middle of the morning. So uh, thanks, guys. Thank you so much for attending our session today and especially personally want to thank my good friend Matthew Dunn for joining us today. Thanks so much, buddy. Thank you very much.
Hi again, everyone joining us online. Thanks for sticking around for this exclusive full sale on air moment with our guest, Matthew Dunn. We have a few pre-selected questions. You all have been tweeted us uh, that our guests will be answering just for you. Matthew, what's your favorite movie? I have several, but uh, I think in terms of films, Lawrence of Arabia, in terms of big scale movies, Lawrence of Arabia, I think is probably the best. First half of Lawrence of Arabia, I think is the best movie ever made. Uh, students, if you haven't seen that one, put that at the top of your list. Epic, epic, beautiful filmmaking. Uh, Elizabeth asks, as a first AD, how do you put together a resume and what do they want to see before hiring you? Well, I think if uh, you get an interview for a job as a first AD, they know you can do the job already before you get in the room. Uh, in terms of a resume, I like to see a resume on one page only. I like to see the names of the people that they've worked for. If it was for me, for a director, I would put the names of the directors I've worked for, the projects, uh, I have the countries I've worked in, and some references. So it's the first AD resume, I would do that. For something I'm looking uh, out for someone, I'd like to see the assistant directors they've worked for. It's more about, I think, who you've worked for than the project you've worked on for me. Excellent. Um, Kyle asks, would breaking into the industry overseas be a good idea for a multilingual person, or should I stay trying in the States? Well, there's probably more work in the States. I, I guess it depends on what languages he speaks and what possibilities he has of working in those countries. But it's not necessarily a, a bad idea. I mean, I, there's probably not enough information to, to give a, a advice there. But it, you should explore it. And obviously, if you, the more opportunities you have, the better it is for you. And I think it also has to do with your immigration status. You're not going to get a visa to work as a production assistant. So, uh, you know, if you don't have the legal... Uh, right to work in this country, then uh, and it's not going to work out. Well, uh, thanks again for participating, and we look forward to you being a part of our next Full Sail on-air session. Have a great day.